I think I'm having an art attack. What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Art Attack with your host, Lizzie Daston, art history professor, myself, Justin Bua, artist. Today is not like any other day. We're talking about uh, we're talking about forgeries. Am I wrong? No, no, that's forgeries? that's what it is. We haven't uh, done that yet. We haven't talked about forgeries. So uh, before we talk about forgeries in art, because obviously forgeries in art is a whole niche. It's a whole underground black market. It's a whole world. Uh, my work, I could speak personally about this, has been both frauded and forged. So there's a big difference. And I just wanted to explain that difference before we get into this so that the, the common lay person who doesn't know about this knows a little bit. And then the people who are artists understand a little bit more, which is that, uh, so someone could do my DJ painting, right? They could just do the DJ painting. And if they sign it, Joe Blow, that's not forgery. That's fraud. Okay, even though they forge my painting and they sign it, Joe Blow, and any expert lawyers that want to write to us, you could tell me if I'm wrong, but from what I understand with uh, talking to the legal world and myself and just dealing with this for years, that's fraud. Now, if they do my DJ painting and they sign it, BUA, that's forgery. So that's a very serious crime because that's a federal crime. You know, the, the feds could come in and just shut that down. But because there's so much knockoff work of my work, like uh, there's, there's, there's sweatshops everywhere, Vietnam, uh, South America, across the globe, where they just do my El Guitarista, my Piano Man, my DJ, a bunch of my work. They either project it and paint it, they print it on a Xerox and paint on top of it, or they simply do uh, replications of my work and sell it. So they're all different gradations and different ways that they're they're forging and frauding my work, but mostly my work is frauded or it's all fraud. Uh, but forgery is serious. That's serious. Like you will be going, if they catch you, you'll be going away. And it's a it's an inter it's an interesting thing, right? Because there's historically been so many forged works because there's so many people who are really goddamn good technically. They have all this technical ability and facility to be able to just copy anybody from whatever era. So it's a very cat and mouse game, right, of these people who are doing it and then the experts who are trying to prove the provenance of that actual work and they have to do it by, you know, x-rays and all kinds of stuff. And, and, and I feel like the forgers oftentimes could be a couple steps ahead of them. Yes, and if we think about the art world as being completely unregulated, as you and I have discussed right. within the, the buying and selling, then this is the perfect space for a forger to enter in and to make a whole lot of money. And there are forgery rings. And I know that Steve Martin was a victim of one that he purchased a work. You were. I was, yeah, exactly. Well, my grandfather was. I Your didn't buy anything. Your grandfather, Sidney Sheldon, bought what he thought was a Picasso, uh, Degas ballet drawing and gave it to you, and it turned out that it wasn't uh, Degas at all. Right, and what's interesting is the psychological mindset because I probably know more about art history than an average person, but I was totally fooled because when you hear that something is real, then you're going to look at it through that lens of, oh, cool, this is real and this is why. And, and so, you showed it to me though and I knew it was fake right away. Well, right, because I already framed it through the story of I it being fake. I would have it was fake because the draftsmanship was so bad. Maybe. That but was you not have... a student of Jean Dominique Ang. He would have got an F. <laughs> right, and I agree <laughs> with you, but I think that when we want to believe something else, sure. it's teleological. Well, we already have the endpoint, and then we try to find the evidence that justifies it. So if your endpoint is, this is a real Medigliani, then every little nuance of the brushwork is going to remind you of a Medigliani that you've seen. Or maybe it's unusual, and if that brushwork is off, it's not because it's fake, but it's because Medigliani was experimenting. Right. So I think it is really easy to fake a work if you have the proficient know-how to actually execute that work. It is easy to 
parade that work as if it is authentic. And the reality is that there are fakes in every single museum in the world, that there are fakes in most private collections, that there are fakes in all of the auctions, Mm. and that there is no real way of unearthing this unless we we put forth tremendous resources in trying to expose that. But certificates of authenticity are forged, provenance records are forged, and it's pretty insane. And for me, I have to just go back to that issue of why do I like the work in the first place? To go to this Degas that you were talking about, the fake that is in my family, at first I took it off my wall. I'm like, F this, like this is terrible, it was fake, now I hate it. But I loved it not because it was a Degas. I loved it because it was my grandfather's. And I loved it because of the form itself. And I loved it because of the nostalgia that it drew up in me. And so I'm not justifying faking things, but why are we buying things in the first place? Is it so we have a Picasso? Or is it because we particularly love that image? And I just think that if it were exposed, which works in museums are actually not by the hand of the artist, we probably would call that work trash. Is it true, and these are just a bunch of questions that are coming up for me, like, is it true that some artists are very difficult to forge while others are easy? For example, I feel like a Jerry Coe or a Dean Cornwell or a Norman Rockwell would be hard to forge. You know, could you imagine forging the Raft of Medusa by Jericho, like how hard that would be. That's inc- that's crazy because you have, you know, tons of figures and atmosphere and environment. You would need like a slew of really, really high level painters with dated paints and brushes. And I mean, it would just be like a, a like an actual uh, symphony of artists that you would need who were incredibly skillful and all willing to do this for a high amount of money and the market would almost have to pre-exist for you. The commission would already have to be done for you. I mean, it like, isn't it easier to forge a simple Picasso than a, than a Jericho or a Modigliani than, than a Norman Rockwell? Wouldn't that be fair to say? Absolutely. The only thing that I would change is your use of the word simple because it is conceptually really complex. But yes, aesthetically, it is easier to ape a Picasso, a Medigliani, anyone who is exploring flatness or non-objectivity than it would be a Jericho. I mean, that would require tremendous resources. amount of resources, yeah. exactly. But the f- most famous and for me the most engaging issue of forgery actually happened with an artist who was really, really hard to forge. Do you know the, the Vermeer? Oh, Vermeer. That's interesting because I would I know that there's... I know that obviously there's you know, forgeries with every artist, but tell me about the Vermeer and which one. But obvi- if you, I mean, I saw that documentary, by the way, uh, the, the Vermeer one, where the guy reconstructs a Vermeer from scratch who's not even an artist because he uses an opaque projector. Oh, I think this is a different story. So what happened... Okay. No, this- I'm just saying that they, in this uh, documentary, this guy actually recreated a Vermeer by using a opaque projector and recreating it, and he wasn't even an artist, showing that it is absolutely possible, but it was possible from an incredibly meticulous perspective because Vermeer is is one hell of a... I'm never going to say draftsman because we know that now he obviously used an opaque projector, but an incredible craftsman and an incredible artist in terms of the way he was able to use color and light effectively at a very high level. Yes, so Vermeer was also a painter of very few canvases, and it was interesting because in the mid-20th century, seven new Vermeers popped up. And this actually made sense if you think about what's happening at that time, when Nazis are looting private and public collections. And so, sure, within that type of spirit, things that have not been released to the art world at large are going to come out. And so this guy, he was a painter, and he wasn't a particularly celebrated one. His name is Van Meegeren. And he then became an art dealer, and he was frustrated by the lack of critical acclaim and attention that his own work got. And so he thought, I'm going to take advantage of this moment and fake a Vermeer. And it was really complex. He had to go to pawn shops and buy old paintings from the 17th century in order to get the correct pigments because 
pigments that were available then perhaps aren't available at the time that he was painting and vice versa. And so that is the easiest way to spot a fake if you have the resources to detect the chemical compounds of the paint. They would use like a microscope and, and in the lab they would try to figure Right, they're out. like, oh, well this is a an acrylic and acrylic hadn't been popularized at the time of sure. the painting and so it's done. So he circumvented that by taking old paintings, scraping off the pigment, and then there's also something that happens to older paintings when oil takes an incredibly long time to fully dry. Sure. And when it does, and when it interacts with dust and environmental concerns, there's this little skin that's called a crackler, which is basically the top layer of oil is cracked. And he had to create a crackler. And so the way that he did that, he put Bakelite on the canvas and then put... I was hoping you were going to tell no, me. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Damn it. Some kind of chemical it's, that actually cracks that you use for baking. <laughs> right. I think that it it intensifies the drying of the oil. Okay. That so it expedites like a that process. Or a gawk or whatever it is, like a liquid or some kind of drying medium. Yes, exactly. And okay. so then he put it in an oven and baked the canvases oh until God. it cracked. And he created this work called Christ at Emmaus, E M M A S A U S. Okay. And it's terrible. Really, okay. I think it is so bad. The faces do not look like a Vermeer. There's something that is incredibly complex and three-dimensional about Vermeer's work. And he only did two historical. Uh, he never really did anything that was religious. And so scholars, they saw this and they're like, yes, the missing link. And this one particular curator, he was hoping to compete with the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. And so he thought, well, if I get this Vermeer that is unlike any Vermeer I've ever seen, that's immediately going to catapult the reputation of my museum. So we have an agenda in looking at anything. The agenda for me and my Duga was that it was real, that eventually I was going to sell it and I was never going to have to earn another dollar. And so I was blinded by that agenda. The agenda of this curator was this is a Vermeer, this is going to launch my reputation. And so he wasn't critical. And that's how we're able to make these really easy mistakes because we want so badly for something to be true. So he spent in today's dollars millions on this work. And this guy Van Meegeren, he was a dealer and he sold a fake painting to Goebbels, the SS, you know, the, the high Nazi official. And this is where it all started to go downhill because he's selling to a Nazi. And then after the liberation of the camps, after the end of the war, when all of the crimes against humanity that these Nazis had inflicted were finally being tried in a, a judicial space, Van Meegeren was, was tried as well because then Goebbels was seen as conspirating, or uh, it was a co-conspiratorial thing, that Van Meegeren was helping Goebbels loot private collections, and so he was going to be tried for that reason. And that's why he came out that he, in fact, was the forger, because he wanted to exonerate himself from helping out the Nazis. Oh, wow. So he actually admitted to it. Yeah, he's like, I'm not helping the Nazis. I was tricking the Nazis. Smart. And so then he became the celebrated figure because he pulled the wool over Hitler's eyes. But that wasn't his intention, <laughs> right? His intention was just to get rich. Was it, to was make like money. A, it was like a quick get rich scheme that he just was trying to find the 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 you know the highest dollar for the price. And then when he did and he was found out, it didn't seem like he gave a shit about the Jews. He was really and he wasn't like, oh look what I got away with. Isn't that great? I intellectually mind fucked him. You know what I mean? Because he's a dumbass. No, that's not why he did it. He did it to make money. He got caught, he saved his ass, and everybody gave him some fake kind of like hero badge. But um, yeah, you know, a lot of times when I see forges, and I'm sure there's some great forges out there. I mean, like, you see dudes in a museum painting, right? And sometimes you go to a museum, uh, they used to be a lot more, they used to be a lot allowed way more than it is now, but like when you go to, and I've done it myself, when you go to museums and you paint from a master, Sometimes you're like looking at the, the artist, you're looking at the painting, looking at the artist, you're like, God damn, this guy's good. Like this guy could forge this piece, you know, if he had the right paints, the right setup, the right situation. But then that creates a whole other thing, which is you need to market. 
you know, you need a you need a whole, like you said, a ring. So that's what I want to know about, like, because I'm really into, you know, hacking rings and and you're saying that there's forgery rings. Tell me about that. Just that there are people in other countries who I don't know if they're painting together or painting collaboratively, but they are producing work that they can either spin as a painting that was yet undiscovered. And so that, I think, is why older artists are often forged rather than contemporary ones, because today everybody keeps strict records of their work. And so Jeff Koons could be like, I didn't do that. Right, exactly. If it's a person who's alive, then he or she is going to be like, nope, not mine, and this is why. But now people are saying, well, this is an undiscovered series that Rothko did that he never authenticated. And so then it becomes even more of this mythology. Yeah, well, of course. And it's easy to you know make a Rothko because all you have to do is shit on a canvas. And it's like, boom, Rothko. (laughs) Hey, I just took a piss. (laughs) Rothko. Shit. Rothko. Okay. But no, but but then, that's that's interesting because... (laughs) Be- because you know you have to think about how it 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 boggles my mind, but you got to think about like they have to be linked to the black market, and there has to be a doorway to the to the real market, to the true market where they're really selling. So there's definitely it's like a double agent, right? You have to have some double agents that are in Christie's or Sotheby's or somewhere that are actually moving the stuff from the black market. Dealing with the middleman and getting it into the real art market. Am I? It's got to be. No, I mean, you're that's right. a fact. I don't think that that double agent has to be the gatekeeper, as in the dealer or the person, at the connoisseur at Christie's or Sotheby's. That person could just be an expert who has that agenda. The agenda is, I want this to be real so badly you, so that right. I can sell it. So you don't think that they're like, I know this is fake. But no. I'm going to convince everybody because they're giving no. me an extra five hundred thousand dollars wire to my Swiss bank account <laughs> on the down low, or they're just doing a wire to the Canary Islands or one of their other, you know, Dominican Republic. Not like I know about any of this stuff, but like whatever they're doing, they're doing some deceitful shit knowingly. See, I don't believe that. I believe that. I mean, I do believe that. I do believe that there's like everything, right? Everything exists. So if you imagine it, it's there. Like if you can think about it, it's happening. So. Definitely there are people who are experts who are getting paid by buyers or galleries or museums to go seek out something. And, and maybe they're like, God damn, man, this is fake. But let me see if I could spin it to where it's real. I think that happens. I think the more likely scenario is more of an X-Files moment of I want to believe. Mm-hmm. And I think that people are not as critical when there is... A, a purpose that they've already determined is correct. And right. that purpose could be selling, it could be enjoyment, it can be whatever. And also these fakes can be really good, very high level. Right. Right. And it is happening all the time. And that's what I think is so insane that some of our most beloved treasures and museums are fake. That is just a fact. I can't do, say which do, ones. Do you know that do you think that that new uh that new Leonardo da Vinci piece was fake. The one that they just discovered out of fucking nowhere. That was just like crazy. Like, oh, we just discovered new Leonardo da Vinci. And then it went at auction. Then it sold, 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 sold. It's in Dubai now. And it sold for like $500 million or something crazy. I would think Is that the, fake? No, I would say probably not just because of the level of scrutiny that now we apply to these paintings that have just like, been discovered. We have no video of Leonardo I like know. looking up at the canvas like, how you doing? <laughs> What's up, mom? I'm doing this piece. And uh, one day when I'm dead, you're going to get like nothing. We have nothing. Like, what are they doing? They're checking the paper. They're checking the pen. Maybe it could be another, like, how do we know that that's not a, you know which one I'm talking about, right? Jesus with the globe. What's it called? The one that just was sold. It was in the newspaper a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That painting sold, I mean, like, sold and sold and sold. Now it's in Dubai, and it's worth, like, you know, a quadrillion dollars. But my, my thing is, like, well, how do they know? So they authenticate the paper, and they use microscopes and they use x-rays and they use this and that but at the end of the day how do you know it wasn't Leonardo da Vinci's best friend or his student sure or you know some other Italian motherfucker who was dope like there's a lot of people who are really good who get buried in art history dude there are so many people like I've got peers who will never be known in the world and they're good they're goddamn good painters and they'll never no one will ever know their shit though there's going to be 
when they're buried, their work will be buried, and the couple of collectors that they have, nobody will know. So we don't really know. We don't, and I think the inroad out of your question is just that art has become a symbol for something else, that it isn't just what it is, but it's what it represents. And so I think that this painting probably was authentic, but for me, it doesn't matter. It's about what it has come to mean for us, to discover something that was unknown and to attribute that to something that's really deep for us. And I think with a Da Vinci, he would be really, really difficult to forge because nobody would sell for, or very few artists would sell for that amount of money. I think that if you're trying to be a really successful forger, you need to go a level down. Somebody who is also going to fetch millions, like but a not... Boa. Like a boa. I mean, a couple, that's, that's like a, a few couple levels down. down. Never mind. That's, like, that's like all the way... To, <laughs> no, wait, that's thinking, like the basement. Sorry. <laughs> I'm thinking like a Rothko or a Medigliani, somebody who still has Oh, that's that way clout. down. Yeah, that's, oh, like in the, my God. that's like in the gutter. Wow. <laughs> no. Like a, like a Rauschenberg. Well, because, you know, I once thought I saw a forged Rauschenberg as a homeless shelter. But then I was like, no, that was a homeless shelter. That's weird. And then I saw one that was a garbage... <laughs> My God, um, you were hurt. You're eroding my soul. <laughs> seventh and grand, I saw Rauschenberg, okay, but then so I realized it was a great. It was a, never mind. We're not going to do the Abex artist, but let's stick with Medigliani okay. because he is often forged. So he has the name recognition where he is going to sell for millions of sure. dollars, but it is not at the level of a Da Vinci. And so I think for somebody to take on that mammoth of a an unlawful act, it probably isn't likely. So what is the most forged, who are the most forged artists then? Picasso, Dali, Dali all the time. Yeah. I have a D Dali that I think is forged too. <laughs> it's an etching. No, I'm not kidding. Oh yeah, there was an eBay scandal a few years ago where somebody was just printing and creating these fake signatures. You know what? I think I bought one too. So I, I didn't, I was given it. <laughs> I was it's probably some, fake. Some, yeah, well, you think so? But who cares? If that work means something to you... It means something in storage. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's buried somewhere. I have no <laughs> idea where it is. But I was like, oh, cool, I have a Dali, but it's a print. Because if it was an original, it would be different. But I feel like Dali, you could forge Dali. Like, Very I feel like easily. These, yeah. Chagall is often, yeah. is often forged. So these are the people. So these Do you high think non-Jews forged Chagall and how... Really sacrilegious that would be to an Orthodox or a Jewish. I'm not, I'm not an Orthodox. I wouldn't collect Chagall in the beginning, to begin with. But like a, a real Jew, like who's got a lot of money, would be like, "What I uh, did really, you know, I got a Chagall, uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, but why? No, but it's interesting to think that like Chagall, like there's so many layers to forging a Chagall. Like first of all, some goy does it, right? And that's right. You're gonna take something else from the Jews? Yeah, exactly. That's just like <laughs> so insulting. And then all of a sudden, you're selling it. From a goy to a Jew who feels like, oh, finally, we have a Chagall. My life is complete. Everything is making sense. The universe is lining up. You know what I mean? And then, boom, it's fake. This, like, ooh, smack in the face. I mean, I don't quite know how to respond to that. But, yes, but that adds saying, another like, level you know, of complexity. But, but for every, it's an interesting thing, right? Because for every world, there is an opposite and dark recess of another world. And so for me, I'm, a pers I'm personally affected by uh, fraud and forgery for me because, I, like I told you, there are shops that are doing knockoffs all day. And I could tell because they're so bad. But I always go, yo, Bua, look at this piece I got from you. And, you know, like in 2007, and I look and I go, dude, that's not even mine. Like, it's so obviously not mine. Nobody has made, anybody out there who wants to make a real decent attempt at a forgery, that would be amazing. But nobody has made a great attempt at forging my work. All of them have been ha, like, just two-bit crap forges. Just crap, garbage. Like, come on, guys. Step up the game, man. Stop copying over Xeroxes. Stop projecting my work. Just somebody who's a good artist do it because they're doing it nonstop. And it's just tragic. That anyway. cannot be the takeaway of this episode. So for no. me, the way that I would wrap it up is just to say we need to be more critical as viewers. And right. so for your, to go back to that anecdote, your collector was probably thinking, yes, I really want to buy a BUA. This one seems more financially approachable. And I wonder why that is, but I'm not going to wonder too hard because I want it. Yeah, and so can. I just think that we need to try to disentangle ourselves from our agendas. And I know... 
if you're a collector, you want certain people, and so you're just going to look at the work with an eye of, oh, well, this is what I want, this is what it is, and so it's going to be mine now. And just to really ask yourself, does this seem like it's too good to be true? And if it yeah. seems that way, it is. Yeah, just be careful out there. Do your homework. Don't just believe the hype and know the history. And, you know, at the end of the day, if you get a forged painting and every expert tells you that it's real and you have all the certs and all the signatures and everything, you know, and it's still fake because they've bamboozled the experts who are, are uh, you know, who are not able to be, uh, for the world to be pulled over their eyes. And, and it, it happens. It happens. It's part of art history. It is. And, and love sometimes the forger can become very famous. Totally, like Van Meegeren. Exactly. One of his actual works sold, I think, for $30,000, which is nothing to sneeze at. But hey. the, the thing that I would say, and the thing that I tell myself when I get really annoyed about this one Degas drawing, is love art for the art, and not because of the clout of its maker. Ooh, good one. And everybody, we do this because we love it. Just write us a review. Stop right now. And just stop the podcast because we're done and just write a review. Just write a review. Give us five stars. But write a review. Five stars. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.